All the money is raised in Tobago now under the current arrangement that Tobago exists is about $200 billion. The salaries alone paid to the people of Tobago in the Tobago House of Assembly is $700 million. For me, I'm particularly proud to be here in support of a Mason Hall man, a Mason Hall Mariah man. Because of our party structure and the autonomy given to the Tobago Island Council, I was not involved and I have no influence over what you do here in choosing your candidates. But once I heard that a Hislop was chosen for Mason Hall, Mariah, I knew you had done well. I knew you had picked the best. And then I discovered who, exactly who this his lap was. And it turns out that I'm connected to him. I better, I better put that on the table. I'm connected to him. Long before he was born, I was connected to him. I sat in class in school with his mother. And I shared the Seventh-day Adventist of bringing this father. How else could we get a better candidate than this one? <laughs> Against that background, all I can do tonight is just shorten my speech and tell you, you could not have chosen better. Mason Hall, Mariah, Providence, you could not have chosen better. But that is if we were the only organization that was vying for the authority to run Tobago's affairs. I could have walked away and said that and I would have done as much as I could. Because Lawrence is an exemplary person coming from a family whose name is synonymous with excellence in not only Mason Hall, Mara, but in Tobago at large. <laughs> but there's something else I have to do tonight other than support Lawrence and also to identify the outstanding leadership provided by Tracy Davidson Celestine in this campaign. <laughs> you see, because we are not the only team involved, and because Tobagonians are likely to be led astray, I am here tonight to have a short conversation not just with you here in Mason Hall, but the people of Tobago. And the conversation is this. We in the PNM, we don't pick up people just so and offer them to the public. We have a constitution, we have a structure, and we have a responsibility to the people, the electorate, because that electorate would rely on us to present to them people who are worthy of the authority you want to put on their shoulder. In Tobago, Tracy Davidson Celestine and the members of the PNM's leadership who formed the screening committee would have chosen about 15 candidates. At the national level, I lead a team called the National Screening Committee. We screen our candidates for other elections. And I could tell you, I could tell you, that nobody could be bold enough to want to offer him or herself at Balize House in Trinidad or in Tobago to represent the PNM in an election while you are on a rape charge. Nobody. Because they know if that is the case, if that is the case, you will be soundly rejected by the PNM. Not that we're saying you're guilty, but we're saying that because you have been charged, it's because the police would have got evidence, that evidence would have gone to the director of public prosecution, it would have been such evidence of such seriousness that the director of public prosecution would have instructed the police to charge you. And if that is the fact, then we are saying you are not a fit and proper person to represent the PNM. But apparently, Tobagonians have a different standard now. You start out with two seats in the first election when that situation existed. Last election, 
end up with six seats in a 12-seat assembly. Now I'm hearing it's a foregone conclusion that the PDP will win. That might very well be so. But I'll tell you something. That is why tonight, I want to speak to you not about your election and your pothole and who get a piece of land and who get a food card and who didn't do this and who didn't do that and who like who and who didn't like who. I am not involved in your business. As Prime Minister, I stay out of Tobago's business. The law keeps me out. I have a responsibility as head of the cabinet and then I am out of your business. Tobago's business is run at the administrative level by the Tobago House of Assembly. It is the only place in this country where I am Prime Minister where there is an executive body running the affairs of that part of the country. And you all better understand that. And that is why for this campaign, I've come with you. I was here for your lunch. You, I saw your candidates for the first time. I gave you encouragement and I left you to account for your assembly work and to account for your Tobago future in the assembly. But tonight, I am here as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to talk to you, people of Tobago, where as you crept from two seats to six seats, I don't know what's going to happen on the 6th of December. But I know what is possible, and I want to alert you to it. You see, if you don't understand what is going on, you can think you're so right. This gentleman who is putting himself forward as leader of the PDP, Farley, who is not the leader, and that should alert you that something is in the water other than the pestle. Why is the leader allowing an imposter to be campaigning as the leader. And of course, in the event that they win, you will have one as the leader and one, the other one, as Secretary of Finance. And Tobago's difficulty will begin right there. Not that is going to happen, but we're just being theoretical. Today, Fali is calling my name and telling you that if the PNM wins the election, the Joint Select Committee bill in the Parliament will be torn up, and that will be the end of it. I don't know who authorized Farley to make decisions for me, the PNM, or the Parliament, but I tell you that because, in case you all don't know, there is a firm arrangement between those people and the UNC to give Tobago independence. And in case you all think that is a joke, twice in my time in the parliament, there were enough seats in the parliament to make that fundamental change, even if Tobago didn't want it. But what about if Tobago wants it and the election, in the general election, produce a result? like it produced in 1986, where there were only three PNM people in the parliament, and that the constitution could have been changed, whether the PNM agree or didn't agree, it could have been changed then. The result then was 33-3. In 2010, the result was 29-12. And of course, in the last election, with all the racket that took place in this country, with members' names, parliamentarians' names being called in the court for all kind of things, they didn't lose a single vote. They end up with 19 seats in the parliament. What is to happen in the next election? I don't know. But what I do know, that you have a political party in Tobago led by two gentlemen who are people to watch. One of them is on record powerfully saying that what he is about is secession for Tobago. That is music to the ears of the UNC. The other one is counterpoint who's saying, all right, he wants secession, but I want federalism. In other words, what exists now as the unitary state of Trinidad and Tobago 
These two gentlemen, politicians who are getting political support in Tobago, want something else. As Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and leader of the PNM, the only something else I know that the PNM is prepared to support, that the PNM is alerting you to, is the work that we have done before. Is the work that we have done before. The work that came before you as the work of a joint select committee of the parliament offering Tobago giant steps in improvement in your autonomy and responsibilities, restructuring the assembly, giving you greater representation, giving you greater access to the treasury of Trinidad and Tobago, giving you responsibility across the board except that we have not separated by boundary Tobago from Trinidad. I have just come from a function, and one of my friends, a Tobagonian, asked me very seriously, what should Tobagonians be concerned about now? What is the major issue that they should be concerned about now going forward with respect to its place in Trinidad and Tobago? And I said to him, what Tobagonians should be concerned about now is cementing your relationship as an integral part of the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. And once you have done that, everything else is secondary. What the PDP is, is an opportunity to do otherwise, to give you a status other than being an integral part of Trinidad and Tobago because they are holding out to you the prospect of a better life and a better position. I'm saying to you, Tobago, tonight, there is no better position for Tobago than an integral part of the nation of Trinidad and Tobago, and that is the PNM position, punto final. So, they have another position. And they want to do it by deception. The first deception is to hide the man who on record is saying that what he wants is secession. Hide him for the election. Put Farley in front. They go as far as getting Max James. He's a candidate, right? He's not a candidate. Okay, Max, Trevor James, eh? anyway. Sorry, Max. Trevor. He brought a man to... I stay in Trinidad, I don't interfere in your business in Tobago, but I observe what is going on in Tobago in great detail. And I'm here very often, because I have reason to be here. I'm a Mason Hallian, I'm in Naval Stringberry here, right? And I'm, I'm here all the time. I pay attention. I watched the PDP brought a man here to discuss boundary between Trinidad and Tobago as an integral part of the political direction that Tobago should take vis-a-vis -vis the government of Trinidad and Tobago. This gentleman, this independent gentleman, is a card-carrying member of the UNC, a fellow called Stephen Kangal. A card-carrying member of the UNC, but he in Tobago, under the auspices of the PDP, trying to teeth your head by telling you that he knows about some boundary that you could have that could put you in a better position. And I didn't see any objection from Tobago. Apparently, you all were asleep. Apparently, you all don't care. You all didn't see what was going on. Why would the PDP bring Stephen Kangal here to lie to you that he's independent when, in fact, he's a mouthpiece of the UNC? And under a handful of PDP leadership, have a conversation with Tobago about changing your status with Trinidad. And in an election, every time Tracy Davison talks about the PDP wanting secession, the campaign is almost over. I have not heard any objection to Tracy's statement from the PDP. Because it is on video, the audio is there, the video is there, not the UNC, not the PDP saying that. No objection. No objection. But they want a boundary change. Today, you know what Farley says? If what is in the parliament 
does not establish a hard boundary between Trinidad and Tobago, then they will tear up the work of the Joint Select Committee. And tonight I ask Farley, after you tear it up, what are you replacing it with? The boundary that Stephen Kangal wants to draw between Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why I've been many places. I've been around a long time. And I've had a reason to be in charge of the cabinet. And from there, I could see the size of the naval string between Trinidad and Tobago. Let me just show it. Let me just talk to you about it for a minute. All the money is raised in Tobago now. Of course, you can do better. Tobago is not doing its best. We're working towards having Tobago do better and better and better. But all the money is raised in Tobago now under the current arrangement that Tobago exists. It's about $200 million. Remember that, right? But as part of the nation of Trinidad and Tobago, $200 million comes towards you from you. The salaries alone paid to the people of Tobago in the Tobago House of Assembly is $700 million. Goods and services is another $580 million. Subsidies and transfers, meaning government pays bills that you would have had to pay, for example, the real water rate, the real electricity rate, and so on, that the government pays, which you don't pay, is another $650 million. And of course, you have development programs. There are things you want to do. Every year, you do a little more development. Recently, the last figure in one year, $260 million. And for minor equipment and URP, which is make work, help you out because you can't find a job and so on, that's another $25 million. $25 million. When you add up all of that, as what you get as a result of being an integral part of the nation, as compared to your 200 million, you see right away that you are better off being an integral part of the treasury of Trinidad and Tobago as against being on your own, being buffeted by storms. And that's not all you know. Government ministries, other than what comes to the THA, various government ministries spend money to service Tobago through the central government. And when you add up what all those various ministries spend for Tobago as an integral part of Trinidad and Tobago, that's another $788 million. The operation of the sea bridge that you take for granted, back and forth between Trinidad and Tobago and the world's best ferries, that's another $600 million. We're spending a billion dollars building you a modern terminal building at the airport to be able to handle international traffic. And of course, the cost of those two ferries, another billion dollars, 1.2 billion. So, we, I just mentioned those numbers so you can understand these people who are talking about secession and independence, what exactly are they offering you? And my friend asked me tonight, if Tobago goes it alone, can Tobago survive? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. We're bigger than St. Kitts. Isn't St. Kitts going it alone? Isn't St. Vincent going it alone? But you know what one of my friends, one of my colleagues in the CARICOM told me one morning a few months ago in the height of the pandemic? He said, every morning I go to work. First thing I do, I speak to the comptroller of accounts. That is the person who collects all the government's revenue around him. And he will tell me how much money they collected yesterday. And based on what he tells me about what collections they had yesterday, I will now decide what we can spend today. As a CARICOM country, very prominent CARICOM country, you could do that too. You could.
could do that too. Your Tobago Prime Minister could do that too. And of course, any country, regardless of your circumstance, you'll survive, but survive as what? In our region, we claim, without distinction, to have one of the poorest countries in the world. Year after year, decade after decade, it's still a country with a president or a prime minister or somebody. So don't believe that, you know, you're not going to survive. But what is the quality of life? And all of this stupid talk about what they want and what they don't want is based on some argument that we have gas outside there. Well, we've dealt with that gas in Long, long ago, since Orville, Orville London was chairman of Tobago, the, the um, chief secretary, we ensured that the gas that was nearest to Tobago was coming to Tobago. These lights are driven by gas coming from the gas field off here. Pipe to Tobago, an our power station here, generating the megawattage that we require for the island is being utilized. And of course, if there's more, to be sold to the international market, more power to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But this idea of what is mine is mine and what is yours is ours, right? Where is that going to take you? Over and above what I just told you there about the actual expenditure, if we look at what was said on their platform, they want their own customs, they want their own judiciary, they want their own this, as a matter of fact, to put it in his own words, we want every bloody thing. Okay? So then, you, where they're taking you, will have to find money to fund our judiciary. You have to pay for national security, pay your own police. You have to pay for your own Coast Guard. You have to pay and establish your own immigration and customs. And when goods come from Trinidad to Tobago, you have to charge duty. If you remain in CARICOM, well, then it's duty-free. And of course, as an independent nation, you have to fund your foreign contacts and your foreign embassies and so on. All that costs money. And you know, while that is being pushed as the new arrangement, they want their own public service. Meaning that Tobagodians will be confined for careers only in Tobago. You no longer can claim positions in the public service in Trinidad. How many Tobagonians have made their way from Tobago into the public service and rise to the very top? You, this Tobago, you produce president, you produce prime minister, governor, central bank, head of the police. What have you done? No, we want your own right here, your own. You all understand what I'm telling you? And that is the substance of the difference that they're offering you. Their campaign is we're going to fix it. What exactly are they going to fix? Go and remove Tobago as a thorn in the side of the UNC and establish themselves in the office in Tobago. And if you all think that that is out of the realm of possibility, just watch the creep from two seats to six seats to God knows what after. Carrying an intention to change Tobago's status. So that brings me to a point where I could talk about three entities. One is the PSA. The other one is the Trinidad and Tobago Football Association, and the third one is the Tobago House of Assembly. The PSA, as you knew, was formed in 1938. Between 1938 and 1970, there were four presidents. I'm sure none of you here in this room could name one of those presidents, but they existed. President John Ludovic, President Worrell, President Dr. Alvin Francis, Mr. Austin Maxshine, and the first female who was head of the PSA in 1970, just before they, became, they went to the one man, one vote, was Mrs. Ursula Gittens. I remember her as head of the PSA. 
Subsequent to her, you had Mr. James Manswell, who I seem to recall has Tobago connections. Then you had a Mr. Kenny McDonald Turner. Then Mr. Arnim Greaves, 1982. Mr. Turner was 1981, he died in office. Then I'm sure many of you remember Dr. Kenwick Rennie. He came in 19, 1983. He died in office in 1992. Then you had Mr. Roland Graham, 1992. He held a short while. And then Mr. Clyde Weatherhead. He came in 1993. Then you had the first female executive president, Mrs. Jennifer Batiste Primus. And then you had Watson Duke. All the names I've called, from Mr. Ludovic to Jennifer Batiste Primus, saw the PSA going onwards and upwards from strength to strength with greater respect as the largest trading in the country. Is that true? The minute the PSA fell into the hands of Watson Duke, all hell broke loose in the PSA. To the extent where the PSA has spent more money in the courthouse with the, with the president fighting the members more than they spent money on the members themselves. Accusations of all kinds, court orders of all kinds, till you ended up with the staff in the PSA office being summarily fired by Watson Duke and the court had to intervene and order him to replace. Am I telling you any stories here? Today, the PSA is a shadow of itself. And the PSA is led by a president and a handful of enablers. That is an embarrassment to the public service and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It went as far as now there are allegations of fraudulent conduct in the PSA. The president declared himself retired got himself paid a retirement half a million dollars, came to Tobago and fed Tobagonians at the Magdalena launch a political party which he owns personally, and then never left the PSA. Collected, collected retirement money. What kind of organization could pay retirement money to a man? What kind of man will encourage an organization to pay him money as retirement, collect the money and spend it, and stay in the office as president? And that is the man that you all want to put in charge of the Tobago House of Assembly? But of course, you wouldn't put him in charge. He's hiding in the bottom line. They can't even cut his face in the poster. It's Fali, man, Fali. Fali. But I want to tell Fali tonight, you went to bishops. I don't know how you come out to. <laughs> because the party is the private possession at the EBC of Watson Duke. I don't know any other political party has that. I don't know any other political party where the party is owned by a member. And all of them who used to run up and down and talking about, they're going to fix it, they're going to fix it, and Tobago, and Tobago, and Tobago. They know that there are barnacles on the carapace of Watson Duke. Because if he doesn't want them, they're gone. They have no constitutional strength and structure in the organization. And telling you that you, you must put Tobago's business into that into that so when he decides who he doesn't want and that one decides I want to stay your business that I just mentioned to you a multi-billion dollar business becomes part of the bacchanal of the nation and then you will pretend that you didn't know let me tell you what happens to people who pretend that they don't know I worked with Patrick Manning in a cabinet as Prime Minister, he told me he had a request to receive, on a courtesy call, the head of FIFA. And he agreed to see the head of FIFA at the Prime Minister's office in Trinidad. When the time came for the visit, the head of FIFA came, accompanied by one Austin Jack Warner. Patrick Manning, P. 
PNM Prime Minister refused to allow Jack Warner to enter the Prime Minister's office to bring anybody. And he saw the head of FIFA, but Jack Warner was outside. That general hatred you see going on there permanently, it has, it has its roots, right? But as far as Patrick Manning was concerned, because of what we knew of Jack Warner, he did not qualify to bring anybody to the office of the Prime Minister where he was Prime Minister. You might have said he was harsh, he was unreasonable, but hear the story. Hear, hear Trinidad and story. Boy, Jack is the big man in FIFA. Jack is the biggest man in FIFA. They even got a legal opinion when Jack Warner became chairman of the UNC. Hear it, eh? Patrick Manning wouldn't let him come into the office of Prime Minister. A PNM Prime Minister will not let him come into the office of Prime Minister escorting anybody there as any FIFA executive. But the other political party make him chairman of the party. Country set the country was okay with that. Then they won the election. He became minister of government. At that time, I was opposition leader. I objected to him being a minister of government, and I warned this country that his private conduct and his private business will disgrace this country. Didn't take me on. That was the first issue I took on when I became opposition leader in this country, objecting to Jack Warner being a minister of government in this country. They didn't take me on. Make him acting prime minister like Vanilla Allen Topping was acting prime minister to the prime minister's office that Patrick Manning protected. He, like Vanilla, were made to act. So they have on the CV, former acting prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And I live to see, and you live to see, that the very FIFA of that event turned around, found sufficient wrongdoing about Jack Warner's conduct to confirm Patrick Manning's disgust and ban Jack Warner from football for life. And the very UNC that wasn't concerned about his personal record and behavior, he being the chairman of the party, ended up as a pariah. Won every seat in Shagwana's West, every polling division in Shagwana's West. And by the next election, after the report that came in from CONCACAF, Jack Warner is out of the UNC, formed his own party, and thus ended the lesson. <laughs> but the point I'm making to you, that circuitous ride of Jack Warner was not unknown to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Because one of the reasons why Patrick Manning didn't want him to escort anybody into the office is because there was a scandal about the football in the stadium where he owned up to what he did there, cost the country millions of dollars, and in fact, there was a commission of inquiry into what went on in the stadium with that football match. But then we pretend that it didn't happen and we just give him a, give him a bligh. That is exactly what you are doing here in Tobago today. Every single one of you. I know what you're doing. Pretending that Watson Duke and his, his band of merry men and women, whoever they might be, some of them don't even know what they are, right? Coming to tell you that they want to run Tobago's affairs and you pretending you don't know that they are unfit for office in Tobago. Gamble with that. Gamble with that. Give them control of Tobago and believe that they will stay in Tobago and make as much noise and shout across the water and blame Trinidad for everything and blame the Prime Minister. I'm not involved in this campaign. Every night on the, camp on the platform is rowly, 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 rowly. I don't have a vote here. I'm not in all your business here. I'm not concerned about all the business here. But I'm concerned about the business of Trinidad and Tobago. I cannot tell you who to vote for. I can ask you to vote for the PNM and give you good reason. Tracy Davison has been giving you good reason every night. Lawrence Pizlop will give you good reason every night. Our 15 candidates can give you good reason every night. But if you want to be in good house and let bad house call you, when you bully fair out, you're on your own. You want independence. Yes, independence is good to have. We have it. You want more of it? Yes. 
Well then, it brings with it certain things. Responsibility for every bloody thing, according to Duke. You pay the full rate for electricity. You pay the full rate for water. You pay the full rate for fuel. And of course, you fund your own hospital and pay doctors and nurses and police the full rate. That is what independence brings. And you know, I told you about FIFA. I told you about the PSA. Let me tell you about WASA. I found out, I knew about the PSA from public utterances and court orders. I knew about FIFA from my personal involvement in the cabinet and of course Jack Warner business is public. Currently evading extradition. That was the end of that story, I didn't tell you. But as prime minister, fixing the country's problems, being my assignment with my cabinet team, we had hard decisions to make. One of the hard decisions we made first was the threat that Petrotrain posed to the Ministry of Finance and the country's financial system. We dealt with that. We turned our attention to WASA. It was there I discovered that with all the talk about Watson Duke being a union leader and Duke this and Duke that, I discovered that he found a way by familial contact to extract $16 million from WASA. $16 million paid by WASA to him and his interests. So my simple question is, as the minister is asking and the, WASA, the new WASA team is asking, what did this money get paid for? Because you paid it. You paid it. It was for fixing stop cocks. Well, WASA have a lot of cocks. And all them want fixing. And patching the road. But all of that was done in almost complete secrecy. Because with all the garrulous statements he was making, he never told you that he had arrangements in place where every month he got the biggest check in WASA paid to him. Didn't tell you that though. Never told you that. And in reading the report from WASA, something came to my attention. It was the application form that the company made to be considered for WASA contracts. Because most of these companies, if you're, a, if you're a company and you want to be considered, you have to fill out a standard form in the company. The form that he and his entity filled out, his entity filled out, the form required certain bodies of information. Number of employees, zero. Number of supervisors, zero. Number of managers, zero. List of contracts done before, one. They had done something in Tobago here, which I suspected used their influence and got something here in Tobago for $800,000. On that basis, this company qualified to be. Pieces of equipment owned by the company, one jumping jack. You know what jumping jack is? Those little things, you, when you dig up, you, you, you jump up and down, pong the ground. One jumping jack and a used piece of equipment, I think, because a back or something like that. And that was able to extract from a company that is being supported by $2 billion of taxpayers' money every year. I could tell you because I'm head of the cabinet, every, every, like every Monday morning, taxpayer had to pump money into a $2 billion every 12 months. And he extracted from that situation $16 million and counting. I want to ask you people in Tobago, do you see any concern in what I just told you and the running of the Tobago House of Assembly on the 7th of December? Do you see any interest that you should have as to whose hand you will put your business in on the 7th of December? And if it is that you have issues I have heard 
Tracy Davis is uh, a woman from Patience Hill told her something, and I want to tell it to you here now. If you have a problem with your wall, or your drain, or your pothole, or your late payment of a grant, if that makes you think that PM is the problem, then Watson Duke Farley and the PDP certainly cannot be the solution. I simply want tonight in Basin Hall to tell the people of Mason Hall and Mariah. I could, I could talk for Mariah, and I started my schooling in Mariah. And I went very far as a result of that. How you come from the top of the hill, you could go very far. Mason Hall and Mariah, you have the option to go to the polling station on the 6th of December and vote a decent young man into office to represent you. I see the UNC in Trinidad dressing in black all of a sudden. All of a sudden the UNC dressing in black. You know why? That is attempting to send a subliminal message to you here in Tobago as to who they supported. That is what a black is about, you know. And of course, you on the placard as they're walking in black in Trinidad talking to you in Tobago, they're telling you on the placard, democracy is dead. Well, I could tell all of them in black, all of just for funeral, but there's no death because Tobago is alive and well, and the people of Tobago are smart and sensible, decent and honest. It is your choice, it is your option, it is your opportunity in this live and alive democracy. When he was speaking for the PSA sometime not too long ago, he shouted an order to me as Prime Minister, giving me a deadline that I must instruct the Minister of Finance to pay every public servant $10,000 by the end of the month. Because if I didn't do that, what are you going to do and what are you going to do? Of course, running the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago, I was too busy to pay attention to Watson Duke and his foolishness. But, you know, he's going to give you money. Under normal circumstances, a person campaigning and offering money to the electorate should be accused of offering a financial inducement. Especially when he tells you clearly the money is for nothing. Is money just so. Right? But what you all should think, where the money going to come from? Where is that money going to come from in the event that they win and he does that? And he takes the nurses' money or the teachers' money and do that. And then he's going to shout at me in Trinidad and say, Rowley and send the money and PNM suffer in Tobago? If that is the road all you intend to walk all you on you alone with that, you know. If that is where you all are going, I'm putting you on notice. No, this country is not being run like that and will not be run like that. Every accounting officer in this country will account for what the parliament approved, and this is the appropriation of parliament that will apply. And if there are those who believe, as I heard it said, that the THA could do what they want with public money, or look at believers if all you wish. What the THA could do is to choose to spend the money in a particular way, but having spent A money on B, DEF don't come shouting. What you are being offered there is gross disorder and misconduct. And if you vote in support of that, you're on your own with that. You're big and you have sense. There's a school within walking distance of every village in Tobago, so none of you have any excuse to come and say, I do So, we're not far from election day. You're not far from making a turn at the fork of the road. You're at the junction. You could stay as an integral part of Trinidad and Tobago where you have the best of all worlds. You are the only part of this country with executive authority 
different from the central government specifically to look after you and your interests. Nowhere else in this country you have that. And that's one of the problems the UNC have. The UNC is not convinced that the Tobago House of Assembly arrangement where you have a portion of the budget allocated to you and all that you get and as they spell it out here for this election you think they're happy with it in their, in their camp what they're saying and what they say to me all the time is that you're getting too much nowhere in Trinidad is there an executive body like the Tobago House of Assembly and for good reason because this country is Trinidad and Tobago not Trinidad and Mova, Trinidad and Pinal And that is what's on the challenge. That is what is on the challenge at Independence. I was a boy at Independence when there were some voices saying to Dr. Williams what, what, what the name of the country will be. When they went to Marlboro House to discuss our independence, there was some people who were thinking that we should change the name of the country and have a name that gets away with Trinidad and Tobago and call it Trinbago or Lambago or Lombago, where it is. Dr. Williams said no, and the people of Tobago said no. We want Tobago to be identified in the nation as an independent entity, Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago. And when anybody talk about Trinidad, they're talking about a piece of Trinidad and Tobago. There's no country called Trinidad. There's no country called Trinidad unless Watson, Duke, and Farley and them separate Tobago from Trinidad. It is Trinidad and Tobago. And on that basis, the executive authority that you fought for in the THA and changed the council, the, the, the Tobago County Council to the Tobago House of Assembly and the progress you've made all along, even though it came up against a wall with these people who don't know their way and prepared to sell you out. A joint select committee offering you a lot of what you don't have now, including additional monies, additional opportunities, and the UNC rejected it. And the Tobago PDP rejected it. I will say to you tonight as Prime Minister, the bill is in the Parliament. I expect it will stay there. That issue will stay there. Your issue will stay here until sometime in the not too distant future. There will be a different opposition leader, a different opposition party, a different opposition position on Tobago and the PNM will be there to work with that opposition to give Tobago what Tobago ought to get. Because it is the PNM at a PNM convention that wrote into the records of this party that we support internal self-government for Tobago. It is the PNM that took that, you took your bill, to the, your draft bills to the parliament. It is the PNM in majority that supported the work of the Joint Select Committee. It is the PNM that brought it to you. It is Watson Duke and the DPP PDP that rejected it along with the UNC. So Farley, when you come and talk about if we don't win, the, if you don't win the election, that that will be torn up and, and, and be put to it. You're fast and out of place. Because you have done nothing except to try to negotiate something for yourself in the discussions. Want to figure out how to become chief secretary without being the leader of a party. And then coming and talking about if they don't win, Tobago's aspirations of internal self-government will not be met. Tonight, as leader of the PNM, I will say to you, we want Tobago to have it. But Tobago will not have it without the PNM standing in the way of those who will prevent you from having it, and the PNM is patient. We will wait until we have an opposition that will cooperate with Tobago, and then Tobago you will get. Until then, what you will get is subterfuge, deceit, dishonesty, and vaulting ambition by the uninitiated. That's what you will get. PNM candidates in Tobago have made no deals with anybody on this platform. Not with the leader in Tobago, nor the leader in Trinidad. We have not presented to you persons who have a separate and hidden agenda. With the PNM, what you see is what you get. And under the PNM, you get more than you expected. I had to fight. I had to fight the UNC to get the Australians to fund those two ferries. 
You know what the PDP partners, the UNC did when I went to Australia and got the government of Australia to support the government of Trinidad and Tobago to pay for those two ferries? They wrote the Australian opposition asking them to intervene and prevent Malcolm Turnbull from allowing Australia to buy those ferries, for, to, to give us access to those ferries and the two Coast Guard vessels. I hear Farley talking about what they could do and what they could do about fishermen and fisheries. Those two Coast Guard vessels that we are commissioning now that go into service, that's the best chance we have of protecting our fisheries off, the, off, off our eastern north coast. We're not talking, you know, we're doing. And while they're bad-mouthing what we have done, contributing nothing, they're threatening us with destruction. Fishermen, 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 fishermen. If you don't have vessels that could go off there and be out there in the Atlantic Ocean to see who is coming and who is going and who is fishing and who is not fishing, what talk of Fali in Tobago is of any use? Those vessels we bought from Australia, they have an endurance of 28 days. It means that they're designed to go into rough water. They can go out there and be on patrol for one month before they come back in. That's what we bought. That's what we paid for. That's what the UNC was asking the Australians not to pay for. And when the opposition in Australia did not take them on, they wrote the Australian Attorney General pretending that there was corruption between me and Malcolm Turnbull and they must intervene. The Australian Attorney General replied to them telling them, if you have evidence of corruption, pass it to the Australian police. Wade Mark, Kamala, and her side they didn't have a line of anything to pass to any police. It was just damage and destruction they were after. And today they come telling you about they are favorites for election in Tobago. You make them favorites. You go and make them favorites. After all that kind of record, you go and put them in charge. I'm telling you to vote out the PNM because I got to be the NRA Rowley. Hey? I just want to remind you all, I'm standing in front of you tonight in Mason Hall as the member of parliament for Diego Martin West since 1991 undefeated and as the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And the opposition leader is Adam and they're marching up and down penal. She wants to win something. Somebody died in her seat down there. And we haven't had a by-election, so she's desperate to have one because she wants to win something. My lady, we will have the election. You will contest it. You might very well win it because at least you deserve to win something. <laughs> but in Tobago, this is serious business. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. Divine providence might have intervened in, in January and created that 6-6. Six -six. Go out and fix your business. You have 15 seats. We have an excellent team of candidates. You are led by an excellent leader. By the way, when I was campaigning with you in January, Tracy Davidson Celestine was under personal pressure. Her character was being smeared left, right, and center by Farley about money that she teeth or didn't, didn't teeth from the zip line. Whatever happened to that? Like the zip line bus. But that was the campaign the UNC gave them to smear Tracy. And many of you here in Tobago, I watch you talking about zip line, zip line. You're so gullible to UNC foolishness. Zip line, zip line. All the, I, I look at it myself, you know. The report has nothing to do with any person identified individually in the THA. I run a state enterprise. I run a department in the university. I know what a management letter is. It was all a lie. So next election, by happenstance, comes 10 months later, and they lost interest in the zip line. You know why? Because Tracy has sued the little runt. And he's afraid now to speak about it because the documents he was waving and going to give the DPP and give the police and all that. 
There's something called aggravated damages. When you get sued for slander or libel, if after you get noticed that you're going to be sued, you carry on with it. There's something called aggravated damages. That's why Farley is so silent on zip line now. The same zip line that many of you in Tobago here voted against the PNM and, and Tracy came here with her exemplary conduct and experience and performance as a young person who grew up in the Tobago House of Assembly. And you, you all go running behind a man who on a rape charge but smearing Tracy on a lie from the U.S. Tobago, I continue to be proud of you. Let us all continue to be proud of ourselves. Thank you, good man. Take no chance. Protect your future. On December 6th, vote PNM. Great is the PNM.